I am very privileged to introduce a dear friend and a leader in this field, Dr. Jeff Akan. Jeff Akan is an interventional cardiologist at St. Francis Hospital and Heart, and Heart Center in Lorsland, where he is Director of Cardiovascular Innovation, Director of Interventional Electrosurgery, and Associate Director of the Structural Heart Service. He performs, continues to perform research at, at the Laboratory of Cardiac Inter uh, Innovation Intervention at NHLBI NIH, and has led the invention of transcatheter electrosurgery techniques to cut heart tissue, and together with a team of dedicated physicians and creative thinkers have basically pioneered a new way to treat structural heart disease. I mean, Jaffer, if I could be a bit colloquial, is a combination of a Boffin or a Q, and also a James Bond, a combination. He, he, he invents and also does it. Um, and together with, with some very dear friends of ours, Adam Greenbaum, Robert Letterman, um, and now we and Toby Rogers and Jamie McCabe, these guys are the delta force of our, of our field, and, and we really, really owe them a depth of gratitude. Just to name a few of the in innovations that have really changed how we do things is, you know, um, basilica, lampoon, sesame, and God knows what else is in the great mind of these people that will, will really help us um, take care of patients. And then for, for those of us who grew up in the Commonwealth and even worldwide, when you look at his training, it's it's kind of the, the, the the epitome of what you strive to be. He got his undergraduate degree at Cambridge as a scholar, medical degree at Oxford, and then a PhD at King's College in London. So he completed his training then uh, in Oxford, London, and Washington, DC. So has written over 130 peer-reviewed papers, um, 50 invited lectures, four late baking clinical trials, and is and continues to teach us in every meeting with his live case uh, operation. So Jeff, it is with great pride and pleasure that I introduce you to our group and eagerly await for your presentation. This is Stan, th thank you very much. That was an incredibly kind uh, and generous introduction. Um, and Stan and Mike, thank you for inviting me to talk at your, uh, your Mishik uh, meeting. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you, of course, to Pamela as well for organizing everything so well. Um, congratulations on to Dr. Al Najjar for for your recent hire. Um, you know, you, this is a, it's a great move, and it looks like you're joining a great team. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, halt today. Um, I, I think learning is best done with with discussion, so I do hope to leave some time for discussion at the end. HALT is hypotenuated leaflet thickening. It's essentially the CT diagnosis of subclinical leaflet thrombosis, which is what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, I just wanted to start by uh, acknowledging my colleague and friend Toby Rogers, who um, uh, together with me, uh, you know, when I was there at Washington Hospital Center, did most of our work together um, in looking at leaflet thrombosis, particularly diving deep into um, the low risk study conducted at the at the Washington Hospital Center. So when we talk about subclinical leaflet thrombosis, I'm going to break this down into um, just five fields. We'll talk about how common it is and how it's diagnosed, what the natural history is, does it impact valve durability, if it's diagnosed, should we treat it, and how to prevent it. So to start off, how common is it? Just a slight lag with this. Okay. Just to give you a little bit of background, this HALT was first recognized in 2015 and published in this paper. Um, this was an incidental finding in the, in the original Portico study. Uh, it was mandated to have CT follow-up. And the reason they were doing the CT follow-up was to actually look at um, integrity of the valve frame and to look for any fracture of the valve frame. So this was an asymptomatic uh, pickup from CT, um, and it led uh, to this sort of investigation into HALTS, which um, ultimately culminated in uh, the three low-risk studies uh, mandating CT follow-up um, for this. 
There was an initial signal with this with TIA, um, and that, of course, uh, was also a subject for further investigation. This is just one of our patients. Clinically, this is what HALT looks like on CT, um, uh, after CT of, uh, of a sapien valve in a low-risk patient. Um, recently, a grading system has been introduced for HALT, which uh, potentially makes any research into this field uh, a lot more uh, nuanced and, and probably uh, takes away some of the confusion we see in some of these results. If you look at on the left-hand side, you grade each leaflet depending on how far along from the base to the tip uh, the leaflet is th th thickened. So uh, on the right-hand side, uh, and you grade from one to four, on the right-hand side, you'd give that a grade two or three. And on the left-hand side, uh, it's not a perfect cut, but that's a grade two. And if you look at the short axis, you can see slight thickening of that third leaflet. Um, and just that minimal thickening would be given a grade one. Just pointed out there. So how common in it is it? So in the three low risk studies, the one from Washington Hospital Center and the three industries and the two industry studies, you see that pretty consistently, the rate of halt is in the mid teens. So what's the natural history of the disease? And really interestingly, we have some interesting data from the Partner 3 study because they did CTs at 30 days as well as one year. And at 30 days in, in a, in a sub-selection of, of the Partner trial data with mandated CTs. So at 30 days, 20 patients had HALT. And at one year, without any intervention, 50% of them still had HALT and 50% had no HALT. So these patients were not given additional anticoagulation and it appeared to resolve itself. About 120 patients at 30 days in the CT cohort had no HALT. And at one year, about three quarters of them still had no HALT, but one quarter of them developed new HALT. And this data when it was presented was, was quite confusing, I have to say, um, you know, it made us question whether what we're seeing on CT is, is real. Uh, HALT appeared to be this very effervescent quality, uh, and the, the link with clinical outcomes was a little bit uncertain. Looking back at the data now, and I don't have details of what the core lab did, but I do know from the Galileo core lab, which was Riveroxaban in, in leaflet thrombosis, that for grade one HALT, which is just at the base, the inter-observer variability was 25%. And so if in this data, lots of grade one HALT was being included, a lot of this noise could just come from inter-observer variability. It's just, you know, so again, I, I haven't seen the CTs and the data, but just trying to make sense of the FFS and quality of this, that may be one explanation. So does it actually impact valve durability? Now this, this is surgical data, but I, but I think it's interesting. You know, so HALTS can af affect any biprosthetic valve, be it transcatheter or surgical. And in, the, in this 10 year um, registry data, patients with biprosthetic valve thrombosis had a higher uh, event rate of redo uh, replacement. Uh, compared to patients who did not. The interesting thing in this data set, particularly for me, is that on the right-hand side, even those who responded to anticoagulation therapy, so their biprosthetic valve thrombosis resolved after anticoagulation therapy, the redo rate did not really change very much uh, compared, to, compared to all comers. The next set of data was um, from our low risk study. We, we had data out to one year, which wasn't enough to look at structural valve deterioration. Um, and there were no clinical changes between the patients with HALT and no HALT, which is consistent across all three studies. Um, 
uh, and when we looked at hemodynamics, there was some change in hemodynamics at 30 days. Those, most of those patients, certainly the ones with clinical leaflet thrombosis did, did get anticoagulation. Out to one year, there was no change in, in valve hemodynamics. Now, just before I move on to how it's diagnosed and treated, within the last six months, still looking at impact on valve durability, there have been three um, papers that I think are worth mentioning. The first is a preclinical, is a, is a pathology paper from the group in Vancouver. And they were able to correlate the histopathology um, of the valve leaflets with CT findings of HALT and structural valve degeneration. And they showed that the, there's an inflammatory process uh, on a continuum that goes from leaflet thrombosis that eventually moves on to fibrosis that can eventually become calcification. So, so in, a, in, a, in terms of preclinical pathology, there does seem to be uh, a natural progression from leaflet thrombosis through to fibrosis and, and calcification and degeneration. The second paper uh, comes from a group in Germany. Um, <clears throat> this is five-year data looking at 820 patients, uh, retrospective registry data, um, and about, again, 15% of those patients had HALT. It showed no difference in clinical outcomes, which is consistent with everything else, no increase in mortality, no increase in stroke. But out to five years, there was an increase in structural valve de degeneration in the patients that had HALT. Small numbers, but still a significant increase. And then the final paper published a couple of months ago from the group in Minneapolis, looking at clinical outcomes in HALT in 560 patients, of which 106 had HALT. This was, in this paper, there was actually a difference in hard clinical outcomes. There was a difference in death and cardiovascular death. So one-year death was 15% in the HALT group and 5% in the no HALT group. The first paper to show uh, a difference in clinical outcomes, small numbers, so it does need to be um, repeated and reproduced in larger studies. So on the background of these three um, papers that have all come out in the last six months, we can then ask the question, if you diagnose HALT, subclinical leaflet thrombosis, should we treat it? And I think the answer is still that we don't really know. Uh, and I'll tell you what my practice is clinically, is that I'd only treat it if it's associated with symptoms, thromboembolic complications, or deteriorating hemodynamics, which begs the question, is there a need for routine 30-day CT uh, after TAVA? Uh, and I think for me, unless it's part of a research protocol, uh, there probably is not. Um, because if you know you wait for clinical events, symptoms, or change in hemodynamics to treat any of this. Now, moving on, what about prevention, particularly with its relation to structural valve deterioration, particularly the provocative surgical paper that showed even if you even if you treat it with anticoagulation, you you still get the same level of structural valve degeneration. Well. Let's talk about anticoagulation first. Well, there's a significant amount of data that show treating with anticoagulants reduces thrombosis. And, and you may say, well, that is obvious. And to some extent, yes, yes, it is obvious. What is equally obvious in, uh, in this patient cohort in Galileo with a mean age of 80 is that it also in increases bleeding complications which led to a, a class three indication for rivaroxaban in, in the most recent um, ACCAHA valve guidelines of 2020. However, if we looked at, in, in, in the low risk study at Washington Hospital Center, there was a randomized arm in, for patients receiving warfarin plus aspirin for 30 days versus aspirin monotherapy after TAVA um, with 30-day outcomes. And what we found was 
that in patients receiving just aspirin, the incidence of HALT was 16%. But in those receiving warfarin as well, it fell to below 5%. And interestingly, in this patient cohort, who were younger and were low risk, there was no significant difference in major life-threatening bleeding. So perhaps there is a role for anticoagulation routinely in younger patients with low bleeding risk, especially as those are the patients that you're most concerned about uh, in the long term uh, for valve degeneration. And I'd be really interested in the discussion to hear um, sort of details about your new guideline statement from MISHIC that, that you just mentioned in your introduction to see where this falls. Um, in those guidelines. In terms of the ACCHA guidelines, um, you know, there's a 2B indication um, that in patients with a bioprosthetic TAVA valve and low risk of bleeding, that anticoagulation uh, with a vitamin K antagonist may be reasonable for three months. And this fall, you know, this is similar to what you do in surgery. So, so if they're low risk of bleeding, uh, it, I think it's reasonable to consider anticoagulation in those patients. Finally, and a bit more provocatively, I want to finish with, with, you know, basically the mechanics of the valve implant and how it relates to HALT. And this is a great paper, again, from the Minneapolis group, looking, and what they found was that the deformation or the eccentricity of the valve as it's implanted the asymmetry of the leaflets as the valve is implanted, and this a small neosinus, which you can see in the in the pink shaded area, the small a small neosinus, all led to an increased incidence of hold, which which begs the question: Should we really be focusing our time trying to optimize these valves during implantation? Um, you know. Do we need to assess this post implant with, say, a rotational angiography to look at the symmetry of the valve frame? Should we be choosing valves um, on the on the sort of slightly smaller valve size so they they're fully expanded rather than rather than undersizing valves? Um, I think this is this is a lot of food for thought, especially in the patients who we think are probably going to outlive their valve. Uh, it may well be reasonable to, to optimize these eccentric valves, even in the absence of, uh, of any gradients. And then finally, we looked at our Basilica data from the Basilica trial. Again, we had a HALT rate of similar to what we've seen, 11%. But interestingly, there was no HALT on the leaflets adjacent to the lacerated leaflets. And what this suggests is that there may be increased flow in the neosinus and increased washout that really reduces leaflet thrombosis in that field. Now, I'm not suggesting that we do basilic on every patient to re reduce leaflet thrombosis, but it is not inconceivable in the future if we had a good, safe, uh, easy device to use to modify leaflets uh, it is not inconceivable that we would be modifying these leaflets in the future to increase the longevity of valves. And maybe we would be targeting uh, a more high-risk population such as valve and valves where, where that neosinus is incredibly tight and it makes quite a big difference to, to increase the neosinus with basilica. And the clinical data is supported by uh, bench top tests just looking at neosinus washouts and you can see that with basilica, neosinus washout is, uh, you know, is significantly better um, than, than without basilica. So with those, I'd like to conclude, firstly say that we still have much to learn, um, that long-term follow-up in the low-risk pivotal trials are our best hope to inform the natural history of leaflet thrombosis and its impact on valve durability. That I think at present, blanket anticoagulation of all TAVA patients is hard to justify. However, selective anticoagulation may be appropriate in younger and low-bleeding risk patients. And maybe, 
the best preventative strategy is not pharmacological, uh, but it's mechanical.